Let's remain standing as we read God's Word. We're in the book of Matthew, continuing on now. <coughs> in chapter 10, I'll read verse 29 down through verse 42. Would also then like to mention to pray for um, the Rileys. I believe one is not feeling well, and so they're on their way home. <laughs> Zach. Zach. All right, Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are, more value, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am not come to set a man at variance against his father. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Foes. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that re Receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Let's look to our Lord now in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace, and watch care over us. I thank your Father for the privilege that we have to come to the house of the Lord. And I thank you, Father, for each and every one that is here. And tonight, we want to lift up those that are not able to be with us, those that are not feeling well. We do think of Zach this evening and ask, Lord, that you be with him and bless and that you would uh, be with the family as they're traveling back home and give them safety. And Father, we want to pray for those that have been made known unto the church. We do uh, thank you for each and every uh, blessing that we have received. We thank you for our salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, our Father, for allowing us uh, the freedom that we have to come into worship. And I ask, Lord, that you be with me this evening as I serve it. May you give me liberty and ability to present thy word in truth and in love. Forgive us of our sins. May thy will be done. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. So we've been spending some time here in Matthew chapter 10. In fact, when I looked over it, I was kind of surprised that this is our fifth message uh, here in Matthew chapter 10. Now, of course, last week we took a little time off as we were uh, celebrating and thanking the Lord for his grace and mercy upon us in our country. And then certainly continuing uh, to say that we have a work to do and to continue on to go out and do the work. And so there's a lot that we have covered already. We did leave off the very last time, two weeks ago in verse 28. So Lord willing, we'll get down verses 29 through 42 this evening. And, you know, really um, what could apparently or on the outside look like could be very challenging verses from the outside. Let me tell you, from the inside, they really are very challenging verses to me as I go through verses 33 and uh, through 40 there. So, um, Lord willing, we'll be able to speak the truth of God's Word this evening. But, really, to get our minds back focused here, let's just talk about chapter 10 briefly. And then, as I said, we will, Lord willing, have time to finish the chapter uh, tonight so that we have a nice clean break with our Thanksgiving service next Wednesday and then be able to start chapter 11 uh, two weeks from tonight. So chapter 10, of course, begins here in verse 1, which is funny, it's how all the chapters begin, right, with verse 1. <laughs> and when he called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power 
against unclean spirits, to cast them out of the here, all manner, heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And so we see here at the beginning that the Lord Jesus gave power to the disciples, to the apostles, and, and uh, one and the same here, right? The apostles to show clearly that he and his kingdom, uh, that he is sovereign over the physical and the spiritual, uh, the effects of sin and the efforts of Satan. So uh, Christ gave phenomenal power uh, to the disciples, and they were able to do amazing things. But remember, and, and the, the emphasis that we, of course, I'm not trying to go through all the things that we talked about, but verse 6 is really important here. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely as uh, freely ye have received, freely give. And so we emphasize over and over again, and as we began in the book of Matthew, after we got through the Beatitudes, the Lord's miracles, um, the, the emphasis has always been about the salvation message, about the preaching of the gospel, even as the Lord healed the sick, even as the Lord and, will, and the Lord Jesus Christ will continue to do many miracles, the emphasis has been about salvation, the emphasis has been about the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see clearly that the apostles with the phenomenal and amazing power that they were given, the Lord reminds them, freely ye have received this, freely ye shall give. So you're not going to go into the towns, you're not going to say, I'll heal you for X amount of money, I'll cleanse you for X amount of money. You are able to receive gifts, you are able to receive blessings, but freely as you receive, freely as you give. So very important things that, uh, that we, we pointed out there and certainly spent a lot of time. Uh, let's see here. So kind of, again, try to give us a summary as we go. They're able to receive. So then we kind of, we got here um, to verses 11 through 27. As we come in, as you go into the cities, uh, find believers. If you can, find those that are like-minded. And um, if they bless you, bless them. If they don't bless you, then you, you, know, you don't have to bless them. And uh, so we, we studied about that for a while and looked into that. Um, then, now, that's your quick summary to get us up here to verse 21. And that was a quick summary, I realize. Well, as we get to verse 21, it's going to make sense as we come down a little bit further. Verse 21 says, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. The Lord Jesus Christ, having prepared the minds of his disciples, by the foregoing promises of divine influence, begins and proceeds to tell them of the sorrows, troubles, and afflictions that they must expect will come from faithfully preaching the Word of God, for faithfully standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the brother shall deliver up the brother. And verse 22, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And so the Lord is, you know, they have all of these great blessings and, you know, going to homes and being blessed by the people and receiving gifts uh, for the miracles that are being performed. But the Lord draws their attention to the fact that you are not going to be liked, even within your own family. You are going to be hated of all men. Following me is not a bed of roses. Following after me, sacrificing is necessary as you follow after me. And so he again goes on and um, talking about going to Israel. The disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his Lord. And he goes on and he continues to tell them. And so we come to verse 28 and it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body and hell. And so the Lord again is saying and stating, don't fear man more than me, in, in so many words. Don't fear those that are able just to kill your body more than you fear me that has power over body and soul. Mere mortal man, the most that man can do to me 
And, and I don't say this as a threat, and I don't say this as to say it's anything light or something that I even would want to necessarily go through, but the most a mortal man can do to you or to me that has been saved by the grace of Almighty God is kill our physical life. They cannot take our eternity with the Father. And, and, and I don't mean to lessen that, and I don't mean to say that losing our life is a minimal thing and, and all of those, but that's the worst that man can do to me. And that's the worst man can do to you if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal, only, and all-sufficient Savior. And so that's what he says <coughs> again here to us in verse 28. Now, Verse 29 through 31, we come back, well not come back, but it's going to sound very familiar to that verse 21 when the Lord is painting this very clear picture that following after me is not going to be easy and you're going to have some family problems. I mean, that's basically what it's saying here. So we read, oh, that, no, that's down there a little bit further. Sorry, that's in verse 30. Three. Let me let me go to verse 29. Then we jump back to verse 33. Sorry about that. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore. You are more value. You are more value than many sparrows. <clears throat> Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, <clears throat> him will I confess also before my father which is in heaven. And, and all right, there we go. Then we'll get back to the warnings. So, the Lord Jesus reminded his disciples of the Heavenly Father's loving care. And isn't that just like our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? You, you know, he tells them it's not going to be easy. He tells them that, you know, brothers are going to be all these different fights and things that are going on. And then we have this beautiful reminder of the love of the Heavenly Father. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Meaning without the heavenly father's knowledge. Not even one sparrow dies without the heavenly father's knowledge. God Almighty knows all things. And so not even a sparrow dies without the knowledge of the heavenly father. And I would go on to say without the permission of the heavenly father, right? In other words, all of our life, all of our life is by the will of the Heavenly Father, is by the will of Almighty God. From the day that I was born to the day that I die, God knows all of that. He knew the day that I would be born and God knows the day that I will die. He knows all of that. And so we're reminded beautifully here that the Heavenly Father, God Almighty, knows even about the sparrows, knows about all things. The Lord Jesus was reminding and teaching his disciples and teaching us that God providentially controls the timing and the events of our life. As insignificant as the death of a sparrow may seem, the Lord Jesus Christ says that it doesn't fall without the knowledge of the Father. And then he further emphasizes the point. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. The very hair. Listen, if I do this, and I won't because I don't like my hair to be messed up. If I were to do this, I would lose, I would lose multiple hair and skin cells and all kinds of things, and they would fall out. And God knows the number of every single hair on my head. Every one that may fall out, every one that, all of those different things. The Heavenly Father, God Almighty, knows about the death of a sparrow. He knows the very hairs on my head. He knows all of those things. All of those things are controlled by the sovereign God of the universe, <clears throat> that God Almighty providentially governs even the smallest details and what would seem even the most mundane matters. 
we say, I have never counted the number of hairs on my head. I, I never have. Have you ever counted the numbers of hair? You don't have to answer that. You don't have to answer that. But God knows exactly how many hairs you have on your head. What may seem like the most small and insignificant thing to us as far as who cares how many numbers of hair you all are thinking. If you start going bald, you're going to care how many hairs you have on your head. All right. But having said that, that encourages, and the Lord is encouraging the disciples, that every event in our life, everything that we go through, God the Heavenly Father knows and cares for us. He knows and cares for us. So the Lord, again, beautifully, as the Lord so eloquently is able to do in the midst of telling them about how difficult it's going to be. God knows all about it. And he cares for us in the most intimate and deep way. These are very powerful affirmations of the sovereignty of Almighty God. You know, we get discussions with people about the sovereignty of God, you know, and, and, I, and I'm sure you get engaged with conversations with people about the sovereignty of God. Is God truly in control of all things? These are powerful verses that testify that God absolutely is in control of all things. He knows the death of the sparrow. He knows the number of hairs on my head. God, these are powerful affirmations to the sovereign God that we serve. I, I am so thankful to serve a sovereign God. I mean, I'm thankful that the Bible teaches that we serve a sovereign God. I'm thankful that I'm able to explain to others that I serve a sovereign God. I would be scared to serve a God that doesn't know all things, you know? I'm thankful to know that I serve a God that knows all things. Not only that God knows all things, God already pre-planned all things. Not even that God already pre-planned all things. God knew all of these things before, before we ever even became into being. Because God is eternal and in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So I'm thankful to serve a God that is absolutely, positively in control of all things, the death of the sparrow and the numbers of hair on my head. So therefore, fear ye not. Right? Verse 31. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more of more value than many sparrows. And that's encouragement right there. That God knows about the sparrows and you don't have to fear because you are of more value than the sparrows. You know, we as people, we generally think pretty <laughs> poorly of ourselves, right? We, we think about all of our own faults. We think about all of the, you know, the times that we have disappointed others or that we have disappointed, you know, family members, that we've disappointed our children, disappointed our spouses. We think about all of our faults, all of our failures. But you know, as we talk about these powerful verses that testify to the sovereignty of God, we are reminded that God knows and I would go as far as to say absolutely, positively cares about the little things in our lives. As well as the big things in our lives. He loves us with an everlasting love. Man's worth to God, right? Mankind was made in the image of God. Everything else was made for the use of man in earth. Look at this in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. We are the crown jewel of God's beautiful creation. In, in verse 26 of Genesis 1, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them, that is man, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that, uh, that moveth upon uh, the earth. We are the crown jewels of God's creation. We were created in the image of Almighty God, the image and the likeness of Almighty God. And we have dominion over the animals and over the fish and over the sea and all of the, not over the sea, over the fish of the sea, excuse me. So God tells us, 
in these verses to me, he tells me that I'm precious and that he loves me. So I could fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. <clears throat> All right. Now, we come here to verses 32 through 38, thir through really through 39. And if we don't understand the context in which these verses are being presented to us, if we don't compare them with Scripture to Scripture, it can leave us very confused. It can leave us thinking maybe things that we ought not to, to think. And so my responsibility is to what? To rightly divide the word of truth. My responsibility is to teach what the Bible says, not to make it say what I want it to say, but to teach what it actually says. And so let us read these together once again as I read them to you, and let's go through them. Verse 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I, all, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. You think this is all that you knew, if this is all that you would have ever read about the Lord Jesus, you'd think, wow, that doesn't sound very encouraging at all. In fact, you would say, I thought that the Lord has said, peace I bring thee. And he says in verse 34, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter's-in-law against her mother-in-law. So we've got to understand the Word of God in the context of the entirety of God. So we begin here, and it says, Confess me. Acknowledge to those that you belong to me. Acknowledge to your families. Acknowledge to those in the world. Remember the Lord said, Any of ye shall be hated of all men for my name, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. <clears throat> we have this beautiful encouragement just before on how much the Heavenly Father cares for us, as we talked about. And then the Lord comes back in and says, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny. He says, Confess me before men. Him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. We need to acknowledge that we belong to the King of kings and Lord of lords. In all reality, I believe that secret discipleship, if you will, or secret following after the Lord, is really practically an impossibility. Because when we know Him, we want to tell others about Him. And uh, let your light so shine before men that they may see. Right? And so the Lord Jesus <clears throat> cried, or could not cried, the Lord Jesus called for an open confession of himself by his followers. That our confession is to be made before men clearly indicates that a public confession of Christ is, is good. Right? Confess me before men. Confess me before men. Him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Now, you know, we can say, of course, certainly we're talking about salvation, and right, and so we come and we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We come and we confess it. Right? For with the heart man believeth, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We come and we confess Christ. Christ. Our Lord, our Savior, is what? He is our intercessor before the Father. He brings our prayers and our petitions before our Father. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. We must confess Christ. Confess Him as Lord in life. 
Again, it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's important that we confess Christ. It's important that we testify of Jesus Christ. With the mouth, the Bible says, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And beloved, when Jesus Christ gets a hold of us, when Jesus Christ saves our soul, when the Lord Jesus, we want to tell others about Christ. We want to tell others about what God has done for us. We can't hardly contain it and hold it back. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now we understand from the word of God that it is God Almighty that gives us the power, right, that frees us from the bondage of sin. It's God Almighty that calls us. It's God Almighty that causes us to believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead. And it's God Almighty that gives us the ability to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. But it is of that and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God gives us the ability. The scriptures tell us we must open our mouths and tell everyone that we can about the Lord Jesus. And I believe those of us that have been saved by the grace of Almighty God, that love God, I believe that if we love Him, we will. We want to tell others about Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Listen, God loved us, to die, loved us enough to die for us, sent His Son to die for us. And we should love Him enough to live for Him. Now verse 34 says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. Now, the ultimate end of the gospel is peace with God. Amen? Right? Peace that passeth all understanding for those that know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. John 14, 17 says, so I can clearly say I don't believe the word of God at all is contradicting itself here. I'll explain in a few moments. I'm not trying to keep you in suspense or anything like that. John 14 and verse 17, the word of God says to us, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And then Romans 8, 6, the word of God says to us here, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 6, Acts, Romans, I knew, I know, I know where it's at, I got it. Romans 8, 6. And the word of God says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we understand a little bit about the peace of God that passeth all understanding when the Lord saves us. But the immediate result of the salvation message, the result of hearing the word of God confessing Christ, a lot of times causes some conflict within families. When the Lord saves us, sometimes it results in strained family relationships, persecution, and even martyrdom sometimes. As we read here, in, again, verses 35, 36, and 37. Sometimes it does that. I mean, I, I, I say this and I, and I know this, but following Christ, we must be willing and knowing because he tells us that we will endure certain hardships. Christ would not have us to not know that when we are called to follow and to serve him, that our life is going to be devoid 
of all conflict. And so he warns us and he tells us there's going to be some conflict. And I know when I was saved, it caused some conflict within my own family. What do you mean you're not going to go out and drink when you turn 21? What do you mean you're not going to celebrate Xmas anymore? What do you mean you're going to do all this? What do you mean that you are um, living a conservative lifestyle? It's not always easy. But it's necessary in following the Lord God Almighty. And now, you know, almost 15, 14 years later, I am, you know, I hear from my family quite honest, quite frequently, quite honestly, you guys are so great. You guys have such a blessed life. You get, and that's not to our credit, but that is just a testimony to the grace of God in our lives. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So following after the Lord is not always going to be easy. Many a times, when one is saved, it usually happens maybe one family member at a time. And God uses them, and God, you know, it's, salvation is just incredible. But again... prepared for some conflict and even some opposition from even our own families. We are said, or we're told here in verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You see, we cannot side with our family against God. It's really not as important to be in total agreement with our family, but it is critically and biblically important to be in agreement with Almighty God. Does that make sense? We may not agree with our families eye to eye, but the more important thing for us to do is to align ourselves with the Word of God and to live for God and to do the things that God has commanded us to do. And I don't say that as in to say it as, oh, that's the worst thing in our lives. And I don't say that as in to say, oh, well, that's just the most terrible thing. No, it's a, the most glorious thing. And, and to be able to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ and to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the most glorious thing knowing that one day we are going to spend all of eternity with the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and the glories of heaven for all eternity singing the praises of God. For all eternity, worshiping our Heavenly Father, living in the wonderful city, the New Jerusalem, all the beautiful things that we know about. So I'm not saying, again, that following after the Lord and having conflict with our family is, um, is, is not to be taken as, well, then why should I follow after the Lord? Not at all. It is a glorious thing to follow after the Lord. It is a beautiful thing to follow after the Lord. But the Lord is, again, He's telling us, as He did earlier in the chapter, that following after me is not always going to be easy. You may even have some of your family uh, turning aside. All right. One author said, as he was, as I was reading a commentary, he said, I, a few months ago I heard of an ordained minister who had diligently tried to get his children to go to church, to serve the Lord. He said, with all of the effort he had put out, they stayed in the world. So the minister mailed his ordination papers back to the church headquarters, stopped preaching. Not that we have church headquarters and all that. I'm just saying a story. He sided with his family and gave up on God and gave up the church. That is the very thing that the scripture is telling us not to do. <laughs> Keep on keeping on. Fight the good fight of faith. I know that it's not always easy. Verse 38 continues to tell us and paint the picture of, of how difficult it is at times. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. This is the first mention of, of the Lord mentioning taking up the cross. And so the disciples, they understood what that punishment was. The death of a cross was humiliating, as I mentioned on the Lord's day. A humiliating death, a torturous death. And so the Lord is saying, taketh not his cross. <clears throat> I 
to have evoked a picture of a violent, degrading death. To have put the picture of the demanding and total commitment from the disciples even unto physical death and making this call to full surrender and following after the Lord. This same call is repeated in the scripture in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. Matthew 16, 24, the word of God says, Then to Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Very real picture of what it is to follow after the Lord. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And I'm almost through. Mark 8 and verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. The Word of God says, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And one more in Luke chapter 14 and verse 27. Luke 14 and verse 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. So, big picture. We have a cross. To bear, and it must be the cross of the Lord Jesus, not a cross of our own making. We must be willing to bear the cross for our Lord. He died on the cross for us. We must bear the cross. We must bear the cross. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Not living for ourselves, basically, but living for the Savior, living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not living for this life, but preparing for eternity. Not storing up treasures in this life, but thinking about the eternal joy of heaven and spreading the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Again, telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Sharing with others the salvation, salvation message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verses 41 and 42. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say to you, he shall no wise lose his reward. <clears throat> in the name of a prophet, that is, as a prophet, the meaning of the statement is those who are not prophets themselves may share in the labor and reward of the prophets by supporting the ministry. One of the little ones is a re reference to the fact that even the smallest service done to the most insignificant, what we would say insignificant, shall be rewarded by the Lord himself. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink into one of these little ones a cup of cold water. So what we would say would be just a little insignificant blessing, a little insignificant act of giving a prophet, giving a disciple, giving a, um, you know, a, 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 whoever it is, a cup of water. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. The Bible says, if you've done it for the least of these, you have done it unto me. That is, to the Lord Jesus. Again, encouraging words as we close out chapter 10. All right, I thank you for your attention to the Word of God. Shall we stand together to be dismissed in a word of prayer?
Brother Matt, would you pray for us? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us, Lord. We thank you for this day, for the life, the breath, and the health, and the strength you've given us, Lord, for each day. Lord, we know that you provide everything that we need, and we're just so thankful for that. Lord, we do thank you for each promise and blessing in your word that you know us better than we know ourselves, Lord, and you care for us more than we can even understand. Father, I just pray that you help us to trust you and every situation we're in, Lord, to remember that you are master of the universe and yes. you promise to work all things together for our good, Lord. And I just pray that you help us to rejoice in serving you while we're here, Lord. We know that we don't always see the whole picture, but we know that you do. I just pray that you help us to joyfully follow you. Father, I pray that you would forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings, Lord. Help us to have the values that you have, Lord, and yes. the perspective that you have on our lives. Father, I pray that you would just be with each of those mentioned on the prayer list, Lord, for Sister Shirley and yes. surgery coming up, Lord, for uh, just all those that are sick and have different needs, Lord, especially just pray for the lost, Father, that yes. you know that the time is short. It could be tonight, Lord. It could be tomorrow. We don't know, and I just pray that you help people to see how serious eternity is, Lord, and how joyful it is if they know Christ and how terrible it is if they don't. Father, I just pray that you help us to be a witness to those around us. And just thank you so much for your word, Lord. I thank you for the blessing it is to hear your word preached and uh, come together and fellowship, Lord. We thank you for all your many blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.